Thank you, and even organizers for uh, the invitation. Great conference. So, um, first of all, this project that I'm going, going, going to present is the NSF, BSF, CR, CNS just started last year. So, it's just the beginning um, with collaboration from the U.S. Professor Mark Reimers, who unfortunately couldn't be here. Uh, so, I'm going to present really preliminary results. So, what's so interesting about thalamocortical interactions? So we already know this, that thalamocortical is not just, a, thalamus is not just a relay station. That's already known. There's actually a loop between thalamus and cortex that is thought to maintain many different cognitive functions. Also classically, thalamus is uh, divided into different modalities, visual, um, auditory, whisker in, in mice. Um, also, we know there are all high order, lower order areas. For example, for whiskers in thalamus, there is VPM and POM that's lower and high order. In cortex, also, right? There is barocortex, S2, other areas that seem to be maybe higher. Um, there are other nice little specks and areas in thalamus, for example, the RT, which is a lot of, has a lot of inhibitory effect on thalamus. All these interesting questions for us at least in the lab it's very interesting to look at as many areas as possible kind of have the simultaneous measurement of many different thalamic areas and also cortical areas um, so we use the mice and a lot of um, um, talks here talked about neural uh, human neuroimaging which is kind of also very much related because we go more and more into human-like neural imaging so our lab can do white field imaging of just the whole cortex for here for example we do calcium dynamics measure calcium dynamics over the whole dorsal cortex but also we develop a novel technique of multi-fiber photometry we can insert up to 48 different fibers each fiber has a different lens and this is chronically inserted into the mouse to image simultaneously dozens of subcortical areas so we're doing both and after looking at the talks yesterday and also today, I, I actually put this slide that are from an old study five years ago. These are single trials. This is a mouse doing a task, and you see wide field imaging of a single trial, 10 seconds. This is a memory task. So the mouse is getting a whisker, a texture to the whiskers, and then texture is going out. There is a delay period of several seconds, and then the mouse needs to lick. So it needs to discriminate, but also maintain information in short term memory. And I'm running this again. So let's look at what happens in the, in the brain on the right here. If I stop it during the delay period, I hope I can stop it during the delay, delay period. So you see high red, white activity in the frontal M2 area from a single trial maintaining information for several seconds. That's nice, but as we know, these are single trials. If you look at the same mouse in the same day, doing the same task, getting a texture, getting a texture, and then waiting for a second. If I'm going to stop it, hopefully now, it's a very different pattern. No frontal activation. Trial to trial variability is super important. It changes all the time. And the take home message from here, just for the rest of my talk, is we see this dissociation, the same texture coming in, same task, even same mouse, either frontal activity in M2 or a posterior activity in area P, and just making things very short. It really matters what the mouse is doing. If the mouse is in an active state, it's really active sensing, whisking a lot toward the texture, things shift over to the frontal part and is maintained there even after movement. And if the mouse is passive, letting the texture come to him, information stays in the posterior part, shifting to area P. Very important. And this is important now because now we want to see more, not only cortex. So we're combining wide field imaging with multi-fiber photometry. So one side, we have already four, almost five mice, um, um, just cortex from one side, and with an angle of 55 degrees, we insert 32 optical fibers to, uh, to target thalamic areas, and also since this is the same line, also some amygdala areas, which are interesting in, in general. So here you can see um, the preparation. You see um, whisker-related areas, auditory, 
um, visual, both in cortex, also in thalamus. We see lower order areas, for example, VPM and PO in thalamus, also in, in cortex. And you can also, I emphasize the anterior posterior axis, not only in cortex that we saw is important now, but also in thalamus. So we see, we can see a lot, which is an advantage. And here we're doing a simple task, just a go, no go, whisker dependent task. One texture, the mouse needs to lick, the other texture, the mouse needs not to lick. No delay, simpler, four or five days, they learn the task. And we're looking at only hit trials, only hit trials, but we divide them based on before, just for cortex. Hit active trials, you see this frontal activity, especially in M2, and hit passive trials, you see a very different activity pattern, again, highlighting area P. What happens in thalamus now? Now we get this whole lots of activities in many different areas. Again, arrange cortex, thalamus, amygdala, from frontal to posterior. Let's try to focus on this during a task, of course. If you look at the frontal area, and this mouse is an active mouse, so in cortex there is higher activity in a lot of frontal areas, but also in frontal thalamic areas there is some higher activity in hits and cortical rejections. This mouse is passive, is active, so in the posterior part of cortex, area P goes down, area V1 also, but also some thalamic posterior areas, like auditory thalamus also goes down relatively similar to, um, um, to cortex. So let's try to outline in the four or five minutes I have left, hopefully. Um, so try to outline these subnetworks. Let's try to make sense. And the first thing is, again, I looked at this neuro, you know, human neuroimaging analysis, like SID pixel analysis. You take a SID, and, this, and this, the SID here is just a fiber, and you correlate that fiber which all, with all pixels in the cortex, just in the very restricted time window. And you see that RT is very much correlated to the frontal part, because RT, we think it's RT. This is so preliminary, we don't even know if we're in exactly the same, in the right places, but this is the frontal thalamic area correlated to the frontal part and negatively correlated to the posterior. VPN, for example, correlated to barrel cortex, and, and more than the others, and a posterior thalamic area is correlated to the posterior part of cortex and negatively correlated to the frontal part. Already you see this dissociation. So this gave us motivation to look at the correlation map, a functional connectivity, like human neuro, neuroimaging, uh, during this very restrictive time window of the sensation period, but we now separate it into active trials and passive trials, and you can see the correlation matrix, cortex, thalamus, amygdala, for active trials and for passive trials, and for the sake of this talk, just takes a difference. Difference correlation map. Subtract this correlation matrix from this, and you see this difference. Blue and red. So red is more biased to the active. Blue pairs are more biased to the, um, to the passive. And just in the last slide that I have, let's try to make some order into this matrix. We take this matrix, and with simple hierarchical clustering, we can group them just for the sake of the talk into two groups, group one and group two, and then resort this matrix based on these two groups. And all I'm doing here now is taking these groups and superimposing the pairs themselves back onto the map of the brain, and you can see these two groups here. On the left, one group is red, meaning it is more biased to the active, right? And it involves frontal cortex, frontal thalamus, and also a bit of frontal amygdala. The other group is strikingly different. It involves, it's blue, right? So it's more biased to the passive state. It involves posterior areas in cortex, area P, auditory, but also posterior thalamic areas and, and amygdala areas. So just from this initial analysis and the preliminary uh, results that we have, we can see that there is some outlining sub-networks where you are able to extract out. So to summarize, we present a novel method to study thalamic cortical areas uh, in a wide sense. We enable to address several hypotheses linked to different thalamic cortical interactions. Um, we are able to dissect the brain-wide networks underlying sensory motor integration. And uh, in the future of this project, we're going to have hopefully much more to have these mice doing an auditory, visual task, also pattern optogenetics to silence specifically a thalamocortical interaction in a certain task. Um, and that's it. 
So I'd like to thank lab members and collaborators, especially Professor Mark Reimers, and uh, the funding, especially the NSF BSF grant. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yep. Do you see a strong interaction between the baseline of the structure, uh, like a static state? I, do, I don't see it because I didn't look at it, but it's super interesting. So, so to have a spontaneous activity of 45 minutes, just to look at that, we think we'll see some. There are connectivity also. Mark, for example, is taking the anatomy also and, and, and weighting it in to see if you see some biases. But I don't have an answer to that. More questions? All right, thank, Ariel, thank you very much.